The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious, of Jesus sextal. His kingdom is glorious, he rules over all. The Bible. Today on Truth for the World, we're actually looking at the book itself. Is it communication from God to man? We often go to the Bible and use it as a resource to understand about different topics, but today we're actually looking at the book itself. We're actually looking at, is the Bible communication from God to man, and how was it written? So as we dive into our topic, we ask this question, how does God communicate to man? You know, we can look around the universe and understand that there is a God. There are really only three possibilities for the existence of the universe. Number one is that the universe is eternal. And we know from science that that's not true. The universe must have had a beginning. The second possibility is that if the universe did have a beginning, it must have created itself out of nothing. There was nothing before the universe and then it exploded and here we are. And that's the view that's uh, espoused by very many people. They believe that there was absolutely nothing and then a big bang occurred and now we're, we just happen to have accidentally organized ourselves into life and, and here we are. But it doesn't make a lot of sense that nothing was here and nothing produced this explosion and nothing produced the universe. So there really is only a third option. The universe had a beginning and something or someone came before the universe to cause it to come into existence. That meets the ideas of logic. It also matches the ideas of science. And it uh, harmonizes with what the Bible says. Because when we go to the Bible, right at the very first verse, Genesis 1-1, it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So we can look around the universe and understand through our logic and our science and our reason that there must be a creator. But that doesn't tell us all about the Creator. It doesn't tell us the nature of God. It doesn't tell us why God created the universe, what He wants us to do now that we are in it, and what is our destiny after we die. And that's where God decided He would communicate those types of things to us through a different method. So how did God communicate other things like that to mankind? Well, first of all, Prior to the written word that we have, God actually spoke directly to mankind. He spoke verbally to people as early as Adam, the first man. If you look in the Bible, and if you have your Bible there, I invite you to open it up and follow along with me and see what God has told us here in the Bible. And we're first turning to Genesis chapter 2 and looking at verse 16. There we read this. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Well, the point we're looking at here is that God commanded the man, and how did he give man that commandment? He said it. He spoke the commandment. When God created Adam, he created him as a fully mature human being who could think and understand and, and hear language and understand it and process it. God created Adam and spoke to him. And that's simply how God communicated for many, many years. He spoke directly to Adam in later, in later uh, history of the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. If we read verse 8, we find out that God is also speaking again. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. It's the voice of the Lord. And if we were to continue reading, which we're not going to do right now, but if you were to continue reading in Genesis, you would find the conversation that takes place between Adam and Eve and the serpent, uh, Satan. And language is a simple method of communication that is used in the very beginning between God and His creation. 
As the years would go by, God would continue to speak directly. For example, Noah in Genesis 6, he told Noah about the impending flood and how he could avoid destruction by building an ark. He spoke directly to Abraham and God continued to use this direct line of communication for uh, several years. On some other occasions, we found that God used a messenger, an angel, and that's what an angel really is. An angel is a messenger. And in Genesis chapter 19, we read a few verses that gives us more information about those events. In Genesis 19, we're reading about Lot, who is in the city of Sodom. And if you remember the story of city uh, about Sodom and Gomorrah, they were cities that were involved in sin and wickedness, including homosexuality. And two angels came to Sodom at the even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law, and thy sons and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. So as you can see what's happening here, God is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for their iniquity, for their sin, their wickedness. But angels came to Lot, and spoke to him directly and said, Do you have family here? You need to get them out of this place because God is going to destroy it. They were messengers of God. They were sent by God because Lot was living in a right way. We learn that uh, through the Bible, also in the New Testament, that Lot was vexed by the, the world around him. He was disturbed and frustrated by the wickedness around him. But he tried to live right, and so God showed him grace and mercy and said, Lot... I'm going to destroy this city, but you can have a chance to get out. And therefore he sent his angels to give Lot and his family that opportunity. Later, God would commit what he wanted people to know to writing. Uh, the people could use language, of course, and God would write that language down or have it written down in a form of writing so that the people could read it, they could hear it, they could understand it and therefore follow what God wanted them to do. Let's look in the book of Exodus, starting in chapter 24 and verse 7. Exodus chapter 24 and verse 7. And he took the book of the covenant and he read in the audience of the people. And they said, all that the Lord hath said will we do and be obedient. So you see here there's a book. There's a covenant between man and God. God has told the people what He wants to do, and it's in a written form. And here you can see it is being read to the people. And when they hear it, they understand what God wants them to do. Later on in that very same chapter, Exodus chapter 24 and verse 12, The Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there. And I will give thee tables of stone and a law, and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. So here we see God talking to Moses and saying, I have commandments, I've written them down. And uh, of course then Moses was able to read them out to the people so that they too would understand. And we know writing is a way that things are preserved. Whether it's in a book or, or in, in modern times, whether it's in an electronic form, if it is written down, we can go back and review it and read it again and again, and we can understand what God has communicated to us. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, reading verses 1 and 2, we understand about how God has communicated both in the past as well as in the present. Those verses say, God who at sundry times in his, and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers, that's as we've talked about before. God spoke directly to people in the past. Spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Well, God spoke directly to people in the earlier days. 
Later, he would have some of his uh, commandments written down. And then when Jesus comes along, Jesus is the messenger to tell people about what God desires for their life and how to live a life pleasing to God and escape the destruction of sin and, and be saved. Now, Jesus, when he was here on the earth, spoke and taught a lot and had apostles and disciples. Those apostles and disciples would then take the words of Jesus and write them down and preserve them in a book so that we could have that information with us for years and generations to come. These are the people who wrote the Bible. In all, we have 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament, and they are written by a variety of people. Anywhere from a lowly shepherd boy who became king like David, a tax collector named Matthew, or even someone who persecuted Jesus in the church initially named Saul, and after he learned the truth about Jesus that he was uh, really a resurrected Savior, a resurrected, uh, resurrected God, he is God rather, then he became Paul and became a preacher of the gospel and wrote many of the books of the New Testament. But how did they write it? How did these different men from all these different walks of life write the Bible? The answer is they wrote by inspiration. And when we're talking about inspiration, we're not talking about just, oh, I had an idea pop into my head. We're talking about being guided by God. It's important to look at 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Let's read that, shall we? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, in 2 Timothy 3.16, the word there for inspiration is theonoustos. It's kind of a compound word. Part of it means God and part of it means breathed. So what we're really saying here is all Scripture is God-breathed. It's a product, if you will, of the divine breath. God has spoken and given His inspiration to the writers and the writers would write them down. They didn't just do it mechanically, but they were also able to impart part of their own style, part of their own uh, imprint, if you will, upon the book. If you read the books of Paul, they will sound very different than, say, the books of John. But nevertheless, God oversaw their work. They were a product of the divine breath, and they would make sure that the writers wrote what was correct and what was pleasing to God. In fact, uh, Jesus, before he left, told the uh, disciples that he was going to go away, but he told in John 14 that he would send the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth, that he would help them to remember what Jesus had said so that they could write it down, and that they would be taught to understand what God wanted. So God was involved in the process to help them write down what Jesus had said, to write down what they could remember, and to help them to remember, and to understand and write down things correctly. But what kind of inspiration are we really talking about? We're talking about verbal plenary inspiration. Let's break that down. First, verbal inspiration. Uh, verbal and plenary are two different kind of ideas, but we'll start with plenary. That means full, full. So what we're really saying here is all of the Scripture is inspired. As we saw in 2 Timothy 3.16, notice that again. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All the Scriptures are inspired. Men spake from God, and they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We see that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit helped these people to understand and remember what Jesus had said, and then they could write that down and convey that to others. And the Holy Spirit would make sure 
that they wrote what was correct because all scriptures are God-breathed. Now, that's plenary. What about verbal? Verbal means that every word is inspired and approved of God. Some people might argue that, you know, well, it's just the thoughts or the ideas. But you have to have specific words to convey specific meanings. And each word is there because God approved it to be there. Notice 1 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 9. Let's read here. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak. Now notice this, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Paul here is talking about the mystery of God's plan to include the Jews and the Gentiles together in one body in the church. And notice what he says here, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. The Holy Ghost used words. He was able to speak in words, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So what we're talking about here is that all of the Bible is all the scripture is inspired and that's the plenary part and in the verbal means that every word is inspired or approved of by God. So the conclusion that we have is that God has given us a book and all these scriptures are inspired and each part of it is inspired. All the words are inspired. When we take certain modern translations and we don't appreciate and respect the words that are used, and we don't appreciate and, and respect all the passages of the Bible, we come out with some bad translations. Translations that try to just assume that they understand what the thought of the apostles were thinking about what God was thinking, and it becomes very subjective. I think this is what the apostle was thinking about what God was thinking, because I'm not worried about what the words are here, I'm just trying to get the thoughts or the ideas. Well, if you read the words, the thoughts and the ideas will be there. I don't think we have to really wonder what they are because those specific words were used to convey those ideas. So if we just read the words, we'll understand the ideas. So how do we know the Bible is from God? Well, we could talk about this for a long, long time perhaps. The evidences that show that the Bible was written with supernatural help, that it was written with more than just ordinary man's abilities. But let's look very briefly and quickly at a few options that we have to know about why the Bible is from God. First of all, it's prophecy. If you make a prediction and it doesn't come true, it's pretty easy to figure out you're a false teacher or not really a prophet. But there's so many prophecies in the Bible that actually have come true. And let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 22. The Bible by its own definition says... When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So when it comes to Bible prophecy, by its own definition, if you prophesy something and it doesn't come true, then it's, you're a false prophet, or that's false prophecy. But the Bible made predictions, multiple predictions, and they've come true. For example, Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. If we look there, we read this. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. A virgin woman. Did you notice that? Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, as we see in Matthew chapter 1, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophets, saying, going on to verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being ter interpreted is God with us. There was this prophecy that a virgin would bring forth a child, and what do you know? The book of Matthew records that it actually happened. 
Some people may say, well, a virgin there in Isaiah just means a young woman. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense that there's supposed to be a miraculous sign from God that a young woman would get pregnant. That's going to be happening all the time. The context demands that we read Isaiah 7 to say a virgin. This is a miracle. This is a prophecy. There's going to be a virgin who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a child. And we see that fulfilled in the book of Matthew. Uh, Bible prophecy also uh, predicts things like that the Messiah, when he did come, would be rejected. Notice Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Well, you would think if you made a prediction about God coming down to man that you might predict and he's going to be well received and everybody's going to love him, but actually the prophecy said he would be despised and rejected. And of course, we understand that was true. John chapter 1 and verse 11 says, He came unto his own and his own received him not. He was rejected. So that prophecy came true. Well, we could go on and on about different prophecies. And we don't have time to do that now because that would just probably take an entire program or two. So we're going to talk about scientific accuracy. There are things that are scientifically accurate in the Bible that man could not really have known about without supernatural help. For example, uh, look at Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22. Isaiah was written over thousands of years ago. But he wrote, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. The Hebrew word there for circle is kug, and it means a sphere or a ball. Now, according to science, in some circles, they may tell you, some scientists anyway, may tell you the earth was discovered to be round in about 1543 or something like that. Well, how did Isaiah know to write that uh, over a thousand years before 1543 without some supernatural help? How did he know what the earth looked like from outer space or how, it, how uh, its exact shape was? Also, in uh, Job chapter 26 and verse 7, Job said, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. You know, mythology might say that the earth is really just on the shoulders of Atlas or something like that, but Job knew thousands of years ago the earth is on nothing. It's sitting out in space. Now, how did he know that? How did the psalmist in Psalm 8, verse 8, know of the paths of the sea? Do you see what it says here in Psalm 8, 8? The fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. There's currents and paths in the sea. How did the writer know that so long ago? The conclusion as we read in John 14, 26 is this. But the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, this is Jesus talking, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The writers of the book were taught and inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they were able to remember what Jesus had said because of the Holy Spirit. And with the Holy Spirit guiding them, they were able to write down accurate remembrances of what Jesus said and accurate information about what is truth. God was able to overlook the work and communicate to man so that he could write down these books and be preserved for generations to come. We have the old law, the time periods covered under the old law, the patriarchal age of the fathers where God spoke directly to people, the mosaical age where God had the written law, and then the Christian age where we have the books of the New Testament. And we live under the new law because the old law has been nailed to the cross. A lot of confusion comes in because you, uh, some people may go to the old law and say, well, what about this? Why aren't we doing that? We don't live under the old law now. The old law has been nailed to the cross. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14 lets us know, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The new covenant has made the first old. We don't have to go by the old covenant anymore. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13 says this, In that he saith a new covenant. He hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth 
and waxeth old is ready to be vanish away. And the New Testament is now the new covenant. It has made the first old. Jesus' death made possible the inheritance for those under the First Testament. His blood covered those who lived faithfully under the old law as well as those who will obey Him under the new law. Hebrews 9.15 tells us the following. For this cause He is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Jesus redeemed the transgressions that were under the First Testament. Those that live faithfully were covered by His blood. And now the New Testament is in force. We are to follow the New Testament. As we see in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, we read, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And then in 10.9, then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Some people might say, well, then you don't believe in the Old Testament. No, of course I believe in the Old Testament. I believe it's a great historical uh, tool for us to learn about God and who he is and what he's desired and to look how he has fulfilled his promises time and time again. As Romans 15, 4 states, the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. So the Old Testament may not be in effect, but we can still learn from it. Just like students in law today, just because the old laws of England or the America are not in effect today, they're not enforced, that doesn't mean they're not studied. It doesn't mean they can't learn from, from the old books of law. So as we conclude, we have to look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 one more time and understand that the Bible is complete. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And notice, it's profitable for doctrine. You want to know doctrine? Read the Bible. It's profitable for reproof, for correction, to teach us in what's wrong, and to instruct us in what is right, in righteousness. It is complete. It is thoroughly furnishing man unto every good work. And we don't need to add to or subtract from it, as we read about in the book of Revelation. Don't add to or subtract from it. Will you follow the book today? It's the Holy Word of God. He has communicated to you what you need to do to live right and make it to heaven. If you would like to learn more about God's Word with a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name all victorious of Jesus' extol, his kingdom is glorious.